Kika Sumanzini, a true icon in the world of Aramodeling, has not only pushed the boundaries of aerobatics, but redefined the very limits of what can be achieved in the skies. With a career spanning decades, Kike's journey reads like a symphony of flight, innovation, and passion for aviation. His accolades speak volumes. A four-time Tournament of Champions winner, an F3A World Champion, an XFC Champion, Kike stands as one of the most accomplished aerobatic pilots in RC history. But Kike's contributions go way beyond his piloting skills. He also has a life worth of experience designing airplanes and working with brands like Horizon Hobby, JR, or OS Engines to develop the best RC products, and is the founder and owner of Flex Innovations. In this interview, Kike provides a fascinating insight into his pioneering of 3D maneuvers during his preparation for the Tournament of Champions, and serves how he trained for the world premier competitions. Additionally, we also dive into his design process at Flex, and talk about his latest creation, the Twin Otter. But that's not all. Kike shares with us his invaluable advice for aspiring pilots, distilling his years of experience into precious nuggets of wisdom that can elevate anyone's flying skills. Hey Kike, thank you so much for, for being with us today and, and dealing with our tech problems. <laughs> Not a problem. How are you, Juan? Good, good. Um, hey, it's, it's really exciting having you here. I've been following you oh no, for the past like 15 years. Since, since I got into aerobatics, you were uh, a major inspiration. So it's, it's really, really cool being able to, to get to chat with you. Oh, thank you. You were the one starting 3D itself. Uh, so I'm really curious to, to hear how, how things got started with, with those initial 3D maneuvers. Yeah, well, uh, I will make it short. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a long path. Uh, everything has a natural um, path to get that result. But uh, making short and quickly, that was a long time ago, <laughs> many years ago. And, you know, the first time, that it was shown to public was in TOC 1994. Um, always is that debate about, you know, what 3D is. Uh, some people consider uh, torque rolling being a 3D. I always say, no, that is not because, you know, back in, I don't know, 1967 or something like that, the Pitts Model 12, full, uh, sorry, the Pitts S2 full scale, they were doing, you know, torque roll. No, you know, you know, hovering, falling down, no power, but those guys, they were doing it. So I don't think that torque rolling uh, or hovering is is what is 3D. 3D is flying post tolling. Uh, so, you know, nose up and you go totally opposite of what it was years ago. It's nose up, more nose up and add power. Years ago it was nose up, oh, oh, no. Release elevator, add power to get out of there. So. That is what 3D is. And that's basically what it opened the door to everything that it was post all after, you know, many years of evolution, it falls into what is it today many of us are doing. So, you know, it, you know, it, it, it was mainly the trying to figure it out what, how that can be done. And it was always a dream and, and, um, you know, try the way to first to have the power to do it and then uh, understanding how. And, you know, now uh, after many years, it looks simple, but, you know, the control surfaces were the big key. And that's uh, one of the first thing was, you know, making a bigger elevator and on, on the airplane and, and, and then start seeing things. But uh, uh, Pretty much, you know, from going from no 3D to 3D, it was pretty much overnight, I call it, because it was back in 94, uh, practicing with, the, it was a new rule that we had by then, where the airplanes were bigger than um, 2,300 square inches, you could uh, uh, qualify for a bonus, a point bonus of 1%. So it was very, very good to try to attend flying a bigger airplanes. So we have our bigger airplane it was a modified boat Godfrey by then extra 300 S uh, with my dad, we worked together on this and um, it, it, you know, flying that airplane, it was totally different than any other airplane we flew before having all kinds of problems. Okay. We're not getting that path of all the problems we had just trying to figure out the power in the servos, adding servos and things that, now are very normal, but by then they were not. And, but anyway, flying the airplane, start getting a feel of, of, of this. What is? It's the airplane 
is kind of happy in the in the stall condition. Um, so I told basically I told my dad we need that. I think if we do like the free fly models and we get the the stack with more, and I think if I add power there, I think Mike can control it. So. Dad and I built new stab on the extra 300 and a few days after install it. And it, it was magic. I, I, I mean, it was, that was in the hair it kind of born. And then from there, everything is built. But, uh, and then it was public when we went back, uh, we went to uh, Las Vegas uh, back in 1994 and everybody saw it. But, you know, and that's the really short com condensed uh, when and how that happened. I can imagine in the TOC, in that TOC, uh, all the pilots, all the competitors come in and look at your plane very carefully and, and being pretty, pretty surprised about the size of the surfaces. Yes, yes. It was all detailed, you know, then, then you know, after we did this, we keep modifying and basically we end up doing the tail of the airplane, not the ailerons, because I require a new wing and we didn't have time. Then for the next TOC, we add the ailerons and, you know, started hairy rolls because... Uh, you know, the errors were not big enough. But yes, everybody kind of watched, especially after I flew at one time. Um, uh, no, you know, there in Vegas, you go and practice in the dry lake uh, pretty much by, you know, yourself. Um, we did like for a week or 10 days there. Nobody saw us uh, flying. And so when actually the first time everybody saw was that first flight. And it was pretty significant the impact it has in everybody because it was a new thing you know a very very big departure of what it was before so yeah did you ambition back then 3d becoming where it is today like that's it's a whole type of uh flying so many new maneuvers no no at that age and that experience no no not at all for me it was and for us, with my dad, it was more like trying to find that edge to win. You know, that's all, all it counts. You don't have, you're not thinking something else than that. Now, when you look back, um, it, it, it was kind of shaping what is today. Yes, no question. But by then, it was just trying to win. <laughs> Were you using that same airplane for both um, precision and freestyle? Oh yes, that was part of the rule, and it, it always was a TLC, and that's that's where the real challenge is because you gotta fly, you know, with uh, long servo arms and the CG, you know, you can adjust CG right, moving things around. But overall, um, it was a, a compromise, you know, trying to get the best in freestyle and the best for precision. But uh, that was a good challenge, you know. I I really like. I think that's. If, if today we have a contest, that's probably one thing is, it should be mandatory, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely it's my favorite format too. Like single plane, have to go precision, announce, uh, freestyle. It's a very complete pilot. Exactly. It's the pilot and it's the machine, you know, the, the aircraft. The aircraft got, got to do it all. Has to be good at everything. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Did you ever have problems with servos? I imagine that back then servos weren't weren't prepared for for like those type of big surfaces. Oh my gosh, no! I think we flew the first time we flew the extra three hundred was um, analog servos. By then, of course, and you know the holding power was I, I can't remember the numbers, but very very small. So we figured it out from the go that one servo on the rudder will not do it. So let's put two. That was like. I don't know. I don't remember one of the numbers, but probably we're looking at 150 ounces for two servos tandem. I don't know it was kind of a very small number, um, and we flew uh, flew the airplane. I think it held up for about one flight, and then uh, the servos broke, and so we ended up flying with four servos and more power serv servos. But we have four, three in the wings, and four on the elevator. The other interesting thing that airplane. You will not believe this, like numbers, like the airplane weights 21 kilos. So that's what, 43 pounds, 44 pounds. That was the weight. And it's 120 cc. Okay. So today, what, you were flying, what, 30 pounds or 28 pounds? And even the 120 cc is not 120 cc power we have by land. 
So uh, it was incredible all when you compare today and, you know, that show you how much uh, the technology and the knowledge and everything has improved. It was tremendous, tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting how we're always doing this thing where the pilot is always pushing the boundary of the equipment, right? Like the, the equipment has improved drastically. Um, and still today we feel like sometimes servos are not strong enough sometimes. Like sometimes they they wear out because we're just asking out of the servos more than we used to. Uh, so it's always like a good like balance, uh, try, trying to get uh, both pushing each other's uh, capabilities forward. And then, you know, in, in years to come, we will be talking the same way because, you know, what it will be in a few years, uh, we will look back to today and say, you remember we're using these weak servos or these airplanes so heavy? Because it's like you say, it's, it's, it's the, the pilot and the vision that a pilot has. Like in this case, it's Jace, you know, Jace is the new person the new kind of flying he creates something different his vision is carrying uh, and um it, it, it's moving a lot of um, elements around you know his aircraft his servos engines props everything is kind of driving that new way as it was years ago i did it with with the 3d another group of people too and the TOC, you know, the TOC was very special because genuinely it was a group of person, you know, we all invited there for that contest and we all worked very hard, you know, one, you know, every one of us did something to improve uh, what is today technology. You, you, you can't say, okay, this person did it all or did the most. I think each of us did a little bit and contribute to, to, to what is today. But today, times are different, and you know there are not that kind of competition, and it's more about uh, you know shows and and uh, you know uh, and pushing the limits uh, in a different way because you know we already made that change from the traditional flight to the three D flight, and now it's you know it, in this case of today's it pushed the three D. Uh, style to the next level, more like a XA right now today. So yes, absolutely. The pilot is to to your point. The pilot is the one that it push it push the limits. Yeah, remember when the the airplanes were not ARF, you know, ARF didn't exist. So the airplanes were hand built. We hand built all the airplanes. We were you know in the case of many years with, with that we built a scratch bill and then we got some kits from Bolt Gaffrey that modified but we're talking a bag with sticks that you had to build from nothing and and then you have rules that are changing every every TOC you receive an envelope through the mail okay no emails or those things so, so I received the envelope and it's a new rule and the rules the changes were very aggressive uh, changes going like I just told you, you know, before we flew one size of airplane where the limit was 70 cc and this size of airplane. And then the next TOC, which is you receive the invitation, uh, you know, you have 15 or 16 months to build an airplane and adapt everything to that rule. And, and then all these new maneuvers that come in, in that package. So, Today, it would be fantastic if we could have something like that. The prestige, um, it, it really felt like, you know, like big sports that you see, you know. Uh, like you say, the money was a factor, but also where it was, the hotel that organized the event and, and all the people around the world going there and watch. And so it, it, I wish it. You know, I was, I consider myself extremely, extremely fortunate to um, being compete in that uh, TOC and be part of the TOC. Uh, you know, you have other classes like F3A that I also put a lot of effort on that. But uh, when you compare uh, the two, they are, they are different. But I think the impact of, of the TOC um, is in, in, in that short period of time, it was very, very great, very big 
you know, the F3A is, is a very old class that over years develop in a way uh, to what is today, but kind of based on always the same kind of flying style, you know, more difficult, more uh, challenging maneuvers and things like that. But the TOC kind of brought the freestyle, brought music, brought, um, you know, jazz care airplane, gas engines and all that. So very, very for- fortunate to be part of that of that group that, you know, and compete and I have to develop what we have today. So you've won um, many top competitions, TOC included, F3A World Championships, Tux Aerobatic Surat and others. Um, how was the preparation different for these different events? Like you, you were talking about how the TOC was really special. I imagine that F3A Worlds must be really tough competition too with a lot of uh, practice and preparation beforehand, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the F3A is mainly about, you know, very, very consistent. You have to be very consistent. And once once you reach a level where you are a contender for winning, um, then you, what is the difficult thing to achieve is is that consistency so every time you go and fly you fly the best you can uh, to your very best uh, performance counted equipment and counted you as a pilot world championships uh, you know it's a truly world championship you're looking at you know 30 countries i don't know what is today i'm not following much but you know a lot of countries around the world and the top three pilots best and that they qualify to go there so it's a very genuine world championships and at that level and um, obviously you find incredible pilots you know just like when you go there you you can feel it so the preparation for that is is very very hard and you have to prepare your equipment and get your yourself mentally prepared for uh, all the conditions that you are going to go. So one, you know, when you go to world championships, there is different challenges like, you know, you flying in a different country, you know, uh, probably different weather uh, that what you've been flying and experiencing. And there is a lot of logistic arounds, you know, you have, you go to a new country, you gotta rent uh, a car, trying to fly, find the flying fields, and you start, you know, meeting many different people around the world, different languages and things. So you really feel um, that you know you are in participating in something special. And the equipment uh, is like in any other contest is so important, making sure that you know it's working, but also is performing to that very very edge. You know the best engine, the best airplanes, uh, props, and everything um, to deliver that performance. And then the other part I was saying at the beginning is be consistent. Um, so every flight, and uh, you know, the World Championships, you do one flight a day. You're waiting all day long, depending on your draw for starting order. But many times you're waiting for hours for that single flight of eight to ten minutes. So you gotta be perfect that time that it comes and then it goes into move you know as it contest progress goes into the finals where it reached the peak of you know unknowns and challenging the most challenging um, uh, f programs to fly the, that's you know that's where it, you know a, a finals and a world championship this feels very very similar to a finals and the toc any competition at that level with that caliber of pilots in the final, it required absolutely 100% of you and your equipment. So that's, that's, that's the driver of any natural competitor human being. You know, that's, that's the pineapple, pinnacles of what, what you want to be part of it. So, yeah, a lot of preparation one for any of these contests. Then you have, you know, two sun shootout. Uh, um, XFC was a uh, Don Low Masters. I participate on those. All they were very, very challenging too. The same kind of preparation, you know. We're looking at hundreds of flights 
to get it right. <laughs> Do you miss competing? No anymore. Um, I my last contest was back in '09. Uh, uh, mentally, I I say no more, and yeah, I'm pretty happy where I am. You got a lot of it. You got a lot of it, and you did really well. Yeah, yeah. I flew from you know I was my first world championship. I was 12. And and I stopped competing in what I was like 42 or 43 years old. So I have like 30 years like nonstop competition. So enough, <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> um, yeah. So switching gears, about uh, 10 years ago, you founded Flex Innovations. Um, can you tell us about the beginnings of Flex? Uh, what your original vision for the company was and how? How was it different also from, from your previous company, the Kickers Aircraft? Yeah, Kickers Aircraft company was uh, mainly wood airplanes, a kind of a ARF. Um, we were kind of uh, the, the, that group of the first companies doing ARF uh, here in US. I think it was, um, you know, Airworks and uh, Extreme Flight and, um, and, uh, and Kickers Aircraft company. They were kind of the three here in US. Then... Outside was like a Seba, you know, Sebastiano uh, in Europe. That was kind of the core companies doing the first ARF. Then, then it became more other brands uh, shortly after joined. But yes, and then with Flex Innovations, it was more, uh, more experience with uh, not only dealing with uh, gas power, but also with electric airplanes and foam airplanes. And it was the main spirit, the core of foundation is, is to have fun. Different than the pure competition I drew myself for competition, as I say, for 30 years or so. And also I recognize that there is most of the people in our hobby, they do it for fun. You know, it's not about competition. It's a very, very small number. So that's that's kind of the foundation of the company. And then have a little bit of everything, diversity, you know, having foam airplanes, sport airplanes, aerobatic airplanes, uh, you know, jets and wood and composite and all kind of uh, materials, different prices. So trying to be broad in that mean, but uh, at the end of the day, the core, core, core spirit of the company is uh, a fun product, good performance, always, you know, That's kind of the DNA, call it, of, of our company's performance. You know, we even if it's for fun, the airplane got to deliver. You know, you have to be. So our airplanes are going to be light, obviously. The weight is very important. And uh, they have good power, very important as part of the fun. And then try to build them as, as best as possible, um, which when you go a mass production, you know, always there are challenges and get all of them exactly the same but um and along with this is aura you know which was from the day one we we have aura and the product uh, you know aura has been for us a big success and it's kind of a big um it's a big part of our um uh, thinking of about having fun you know so um, yeah that's kind of it's very different than What, what it was before with Kicker as an aircraft company, um, just for the fact that, you know, this is more about for the customers and to have fun, you know, for them so they can have fun. How did Aura come into the picture? It, it's, a, it's a natural progression, you know, when um, I was at Horizon, I worked there for a few years and we, they, we experiment there. Um, you know airplanes having no uh, no gyro and airplanes having gyros and you could see right away the tremendous impact that it has on uh, on on the customers how much uh, enjoy enjoyment um, customer has with with the gyro you know airplanes that were uh, you could see it on reflected on on sales and you know airplanes that uh, did not have a gyro and then they add the gyro like uh, ultra micro airplanes you could see the jump it was the sale was not like double it was like 10 times more you know so it's just a big big number so 
it's because people want to have fun and that's what it is. So from, so from day one, um, we're very lucky to have uh, Joe Birch, he's um, with us from the go, as our engineer. Um, and he's, you know, I can have all kind of ideas and everything, but uh, Joe at the end of the day is, is the one that did it. And, but always we work very close with the concept of, our aura is not, just a gyro is a flight controller. That's very important. And that's the important part because you go, you, you get a PMP, our PMP is, you know, everything set up, you know, your rates, your mix. Uh, they say, why is this airplane flying knife edge so straight? Well, it's a good design, but also there's some mix there that we, you know, we set up. And then you already have all these um, fly modes, the radio system, the, the aura will talk to all the radio brands which has been also a core thing for us like we want to make friendly our airplanes for all brands not just one specific brand so you you pick one of our uh, super pmp you link and then you are going to fly the airplane exactly in the same conditions that i personally tune the airplane so you will experience the same you say okay it feels the same way your expos your rates your mix so that's what Aura brings. And I think that's kind of the number one thing because through the Aura, <clears throat> we will be able to do uh, things like, you know, crow, um, biplanes uh, with crow. We, you know, so many different, um, you know, light wing flaps and ailerons, a couple have the flaps uh, from the Aura. All this, that if you think about it, if, imagine if, if those PMP didn't have the order. So how you do that? First, you need a very expensive transmitter, right? You're not going to do it with a six-channel radio. Um, second, who's going to program that? I mean, you need uh, hours of, of video tutorial how to do it, and then and then still, you know, the fine tune of it. You know, the amount of mix you need for elevator for the flaps. When the crow deploy, you need a mix, you need, uh, you know, your expos and everything that you're going to get with, with the Aura. So the number one thing on Aura is that flight control. And then, you know, on top of that, you put the gyro, which, uh, you know, it helps tremendously for uh, the fun factor. You know, it get windy, the airplane doesn't bounce around so much. And especially when you get smaller in size, the airplane gets bigger. It's by itself, I call the bigger it gets, it's like a gyro effect. It's the same. When you fly a 200cc airplane, it probably feels like, um, you know, I'm flying a 50cc uh, gas airplane with the aura. That's how it feels, kind of your experience with this too. So this is, this is kind of why from the go and um, we thought of the aura. And, I could say, uh, you know, uh, as as today that you know it, it it was good. It was a good decision, and it, it opened options too. You know, because I always say this: uh, the 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 most important is to have options. You know, you that's why the our system talks to all our radios. So pilots, of course, customer has options, so they can choose the radio they like. You can have your different ways to fly your aura, you I mean you can have it gyro off, you know, and you have still having the controller. You can choose not to use the aura too, you know, like we do with our ARF, you know. And so the the option that we brought to the customer is a is a very good option and many are taking it. And so you know that's kind of a the core idea on the aura. Yes. I wanted to ask you about your design process how how do you go from have this idea to the point where you have the airplane in the hands of of your customers are you able to talk a bit about that yeah um i don't know how to how to describe uh, it's in the meaning of how the idea happens you know i i think it's just kind of your brain process what they see and what the brain see, what you think, and then kind of spark an idea. The idea could be different kind of airplanes, um, and it could be different kind of shapes, 
uh, but that's kind of uh, the core of everything else. So that's what, you know, that's how the RV8 uh, was born and, you know, how the Cessna was born uh, or the Mamba was born. Um, so I don't have like a, a fully explanation. What's that process to one night, one morning, get up and say, I do this. I just don't know. Okay. So that's one part. But once you have that, then that's when the experience will tell you where it will be first, what size, you know, and what material. Once you define those two, then it's time to say, uh, you know, uh, the vendor, you choose factory uh, who's going to do this. And then you kind of get that definition and then you go to the computer and uh, start drawing the airplane. And then once you have your uh, outline um, and sizes and everything you want, then you start looking at the structure. You know, if it's, if it's going to be good, you know, you work on the structure and then, uh, you know, and then basically that's how you move it from there. And then it's a continuous communication with, uh, with the factory to, to get to the point, all these drawings, um, to the point that they're ready to be executed. You know, in case of, of the foam airplanes, there's a lot of, uh, uh 3d drawing you know solid works basically to to get it you know shapes and and also there is a lot of molding uh that you had to think about how you are going to mold things and and how how the parts are going to be uh mold and then understand about you know plastics and understand about the foam itself and how you can save weight and you know, all that process it takes, um, uh, you know, a lot, a lot back and forth with with the factory, and and then one day, uh, you know, you feel like uh, factory also feels like okay, we're we're ready to produce a prototype, you know. In case of the uh, foam airplanes, you uh, basically you are going to CNC um, a, a foam airplane. So you imagine you take a block of foam. And then you're going to milling with uh, with your drawings, going to milling all the parts, and then trying to emulate best possible what it was going to be production. So there is a lot of things there happening. Like weight is a big factor. Uh, you know, you need to know what because it's a different kind of foam that you're going to use for that process than the foam that you're going to use. You know, one is EPS, similar to the cooler. You know, you go buy in Seven Eleven. That's the material. And then that's for CNC. And then there are different densities and kind of bead size and things that you need to make good call on what you want. And then um, milling all that out. And then basically you want to get an airplane that is pretty close. You go out there, start flying and uh, look for changes and everything. And then one day you feel it that you're ready for the mold. Um, that's his, um, that process. Um, uh, you know, you have to say this, it takes pretty much everything you know because there is a lot of thing happening during this. And then it's the design of, design of the airplane itself, you know, airfoils that you choose, you know, center of gravity is always the biggest challenge, you know. Who, no matter what other people will, t the, the CG is the biggest challenge because you have, Especially now that where all our batteries are so light and and um, uh, you know on the foam airplanes is everything is kind of rigid. There is not much of mo things move around, and so center of gravity is, is one of the challenging. Then you have all the electronics. You know, you have the servos and the SCs, the motors that we also do all that part. And so it's it's a it's a big process and. But you know, in 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 general, from the time you start with the idea until you see it uh, kind of arrive to our warehouse and it's free to ship, you know, a foam airplane you're looking at you know fourteen to eighteen months or something like that. 
that's that's the time and that you know require a lot of work and then you know you in our case we have all these different sizes of airplanes and different kind of airplanes so you have a constant movement of many many projects at the same time so as we're growing um we add in more airplanes and one thing that our company has been very successful and i, I call that good success is our very first airplane, it was the QQ Extra 300, still today one of our best sellers, um, and, and all the others. So we are not putting away airplanes because they perform, people like it. So our line is growing and because we keep adding. So, and we try to keep them up to date, G2s with Generation 2, Generation 3, try to keep it, you know, the best, when we see something and we see, we take note, the customer also has always good ideas. We hear and say, you know, we take notes when our note gets, I mean, okay, let's do a G2, you know, because there is something that we can improve. So always, always aiming to do the best we can. <laughs> That's the guarantee. <laughs> yeah, it seems definitely like a, to, it's a very long, hard process to get an airplane to the market. Um, speaking of, very recently you released the the new twin otter can you can you talk about that one that looks like, like a really different really fun airplane yes it's a it's a it's a it's a fun airplane i really enjoy uh, flying the twin otter and you know the the spirit of the twin otter is is to experience um you know what uh, a a twin motor is will fly as a sport airplane and how good is the airplane flying slow and how clean actually it flies in precision aerobatics you can Juan you can do a very nice eight point rolls with that twin otter so it feels it feels great and then you know on top of that we have the differential thrust like it brings another element for the aerobatics but always is with the spirit of trying to explore and expand the most possible the flight envelope so um, imagine you're flying an rv860 that's what the twin other is that's kind of flying is similar but then you add another element which is the differential thrust so and that's what i think the success of of airplanes is always about the flight envelope wider it is more customers will enjoy it because it becomes an airplane for everybody. And that's what I like about the Twin Otter. It, it, it flies slow, it's very forgiving, uh, take off very slow, and, and also it has really good punch, good power, good top speed, good flight time. And, um, you know, it will do very good basic 3D. And so it, it's a lot of fun. It, it sounds good too, you know, just the Twin, it sounds good. And um, it operates with one battery, uh, you know, one sixty two hundred success. Uh, so it's it, it's simple and to operate, and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, I think wider you get the envelope, you know, all the, all all depends on how you want to fly. You know, you I imagine customers will just want to fly as a sport um others others will like to do more crazy things with it others would like to have floats with it so that's what the twin otter is the twin otter is pure fun really wide flying envelope and that's why i think uh, the the enjoyment and the joy when you fly it reflects all these elements you know it just make it really fun I personally have a lot of fun with it. <laughs> I bet. Uh, I can imagine that plane being pretty successful. I, I think what you said about it being pretty similar concept as the as the RV in the sense that it's a sport plane, pretty approachable for any level, but then you can do some 3D, you can do um, some interesting things with the differential motor, right? Those, uh, those flips that I've seen you do uh, looks like really really fun yeah and the aura you know it's a big factor of, of this it's kind of the heart of this you know you have um you operating this with a very 
low-end radio. You don't need a crazy radio to do all these uh, mixes that it has. And, you know, you have Crow, you have the Claps, you have the Light Wing, you have the Differential Trust, and you have Gain also in the Differential Trust. So you imagine you are in a high alpha like this, and then you have your right motor and your left motor are, are with gain. So you're doing this hairy around, it's so lock in, it's just so fun to fly. And then when you, you know, park it and go for hover, counter rotating props, so there is no torque. So the airplane is super stable. So the aura, it's a very big element in this airplane because it put together all these uh, thoughts that we have, and you know, with the help of uh, Joe, um, I pretty much say, Joe, will be, can we do this? And we try, and then go and test. And uh, so, aura is very important for the twin otter, definitely. But um, I expect, uh, you know, the, the, the twin otter to be a, a pretty important project and product for, for Flex Innovation. I will agree with you. It's also on top of the fun factor. I think it's also really cool to see something a bit different. I think uh, you know, I, I love aerobatics. I love 3D extreme aerobatics, but we have a lot of extras, edges. Um, you know, the, the same type of planes. I think it's it's pretty uncommon to see a, a twin other in general. And if on top of it you make it fun and, and easy to fly, it's even even more interesting. And it's a good size airplane too. You know, it's 90 inches and it's a big for a foam. It's big. The other day we were taking some pictures and you put it next to the, you know, 35%. It, I mean, it, it's smaller, obviously, but you can see the size, you know, it's just kind of good size. And, um, uh, you know, the other thing is you put it together very quickly, you know. So if you're going to spend hours and hours building the airplane, which is also an important factor. And all the batteries you're using on your RV860 or you know, or your cap or your Mamba 60, the same batteries won't work on this airplane. So, um, yeah, they are they are marching very well. They are in production right now, um, building um, every day. We in contact with the factory. I do a lot of, you know, kind of FaceTime and checking everything. It's moving along very well. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we are going to have it here during the fall as we, we've been advertising. Jace Ducia, one of the best freestyle pilots in the world right now, recently joined the Flex team. What are you the most excited about working with him and, and having him in the team? Oh, you know, uh, it's a good question. I, I'm very excited because um, I like to be on the edge. Uh, that's my DNA, always been like this from, from a kid that I started flying. So uh, he's on the edge today you know he is the edge um everybody tried to emulate and try to follow and so i'm pretty excited to be part of it and be able to see my airplanes um flying on that edge who will not be excited right so uh, working with him is truly a pleasure um his knowledge about uh flying the field for the airplane is remarkable you can expect nothing else than that from a person that is kind of setting the bar so he knows exactly why everything um uh, you know uh, what is happening and the reason why and so very very hard worker and you can tell and um, he's gifted obviously but also he works very hard so that's as in any sport, anything that you do in life, to excel, to, to be the best and to, to get to reach that fine, fine point at top, it required two elements, gift and hard work. And that combined is very powerful. So I'm, I'm very, not only me, so the whole team at Flex, we're very honored to have him on board and looking forward to many things that um we can we can do together as um somebody that has been in the industry for a very long time on both sides as a as a competition pilot and as a um you know developer designer um how do you feel about the state of rc 
uh, these days? Are you feeling excited about it? Are you feeling worried? I know some, some, sometimes people uh, tend to be very negative about, you know, FPVs, like changing um, RCR plans or, or things like that. Do you feel optimistic about the, about the industry? Um, I, I think the hobby, uh, it has new uh, branches, you know. Our, our branch is, it's, it's about the looks, you know, we are not, FPV is totally different, you know, it's not the same. Uh, uh, I, I remember when the drones came, uh, some people say everybody will be flying drones now, but the drones, they all look the same and it's not about, it's a different feel. For us, it's a lot about the looks, it's about presentation. Uh, call it maneuvers, call it shapes of different things that we fly, the way they fly, but it's all around how it presents, how it looks, right? So the color schemes, the shapes of the airplanes, the maneuvers that we do. So I feel very, very good because it has been very stable for years. I don't see a path. I personally, I don't see a path of uh, an explosion happening here to growth. I don't see a path to the future to finish or going down, I see stable uh, personally. I see it that way. Um, so I think I think the hobby, uh, in my opinion, is the future is is stable. Uh, that's what I would say, and it has a path that it, it will not change. That's what I say before. It's all about uh, presentation, looks, and that it will continue to be the same way. If you look um, years ago, what we tried to achieve and today what we try to achieve is very similar. I mean, I go 30 years ago and when I was competing and doing everything and I moved 20 years ago, I moved 10 years ago, I moved today and I will move to the future. I was still about the same performance, looks, what we see, what we appreciate, what excites us, you know? What it make, a, what it make you to put the airplane on your car and go and fly, right? What excites you? It's, it's that new model. It's about a new scheme. It's about a new setup. It's about, you know, the new maneuver you want to try because that is the core. So there are other branches like, you know, FPV, there is the drones, there is other things that might come in the future, but what we love to do, the crazy people that we are, it was still crazy, you know, for years to come. Same way. I don't see a change. Do you have any final words of advice for somebody out there that is looking at you, looking at Jay's, uh, it's feeling inspired to, to improve their skills, whether it is in robotics or something else in RC? Um, how, how, how to go about that? How, what's the best way for them to, to keep progressing as a pilot? Um, I think if you truly love what you do, probably follow your heart. Of, that will be your main energy to go out there and practice, you know, everything is all about practice when you want to be a pilot and exceed and be the best you can be is practice and also put a lot of thoughts on it, you know? So there are, there are things that happen when you compete and improvements that actually are not the feel. They are, they are because you're thinking all the time. You know, that's called passion. You gotta be really passionate, you're crazy, okay? Very, very passionate about it. Think all the time about it, practice, and, and search for that edge. You know, push yourself and do things that you don't like to do. For example, you don't like to, to, to roll to the right, but you prefer to roll to the left, just an, an example. Well, go to the field and do all the time right. Do the things that you don't like. Do the things that are hard for you and do it all the time until it gets similar because it's like any other sport. There are preference for we, the humans, you know, we like to do, you know, 
kick your ball if you're a soccer player kick it with left or right you know uh, if you're a ballet dancer you, you know twist it left or right or whatever rolling airplanes is the same you know and so do that things that challenge you and and then become more uh, as i call symmetrical pilots it, it's like any direction that's kind of the foundation um so that would be my advice is is is, is try that if 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 you want to become you know the best pilot that you could be and then work very hard and i think there is nobody out there that you could name you know top pilots that they have in practice uh, it's it's uh, and try and you have to try outside of the box try new things too because that's also part of what it make you to go to the field to try those new things you know the way you set your airplane sometimes you have a routine have a way to do it but you have the open mind because always there is a setup that it will be interesting to try and might get you that that little extra that you're looking for so yep and and be very passionate about what you do and that would be my advice and um and the other thing i i i, I have to say like uh, somebody's is kind of starting to fly and want to make the progress through um you know i think trying to fly more days than just try to fly one day a lot of flights um, it's a very important because let's see for example in a week you go and do you know three flights a day so that would be 15 right five days you go 15 flights let's say i can go on a weekend and i do 15 flights right but it's not the same the three flights a day is going to be more it will help you more because in those nights in between your your brain your ideas you kind of organize and then magically the next morning you go it kind of happened better it just you make that progress so that's another i think important advice is try to get that quality uh, of your fly improve by doing in several days it's just try to condense in once and uh, also it's part of good for those guys that are learning the equipment and everything you can do maintenance kind of checking out things in between um it also helps to understand and for the young kids um to really fly an airplane very well you need to understand your equipment you need to understand how things work you can't be just a fly simulator and go and and, and and do it you gotta understand your equipment i'm not saying that understand in depth but at, at least have a knowledge of you know your engine your servos your equipment setting up and you know setting up your radio and those things it has a tremendous impact on on your on your flying skill it's a combination um setting up an airplane i give you an example it's, it's similar and when you compare to a, a racing cars or any sport where um, there is a, a vehicle in between you you know i i'm pretty sure that uh, i'm not being I, i'm a big fan of formula one um and so i've been following years for years formula one and and i know that you know those really top drivers you know you call it uh, senna you call it schumacher you call it today you know hamilton or verstappen today all those guys they know the equipment they're not just drivers so they go they say they will talk to engineers and say you know you know this you know all these adjustments all these settings the airplane is very similar um so for those kids that are, are you know starting or very interest on get interest on the equipment and that will make um and also you know in your path for life you also learn something new and who knows maybe some of them are um you know mechanical engineer or mechanics for airplanes and things like that so that would be my advice sorry for the long one but i think all these points 
yeah, all these tips are, you know, if you take one of them, it, it, it will work. So take the most you can. <laughs> well, thank Excellent. you so much, Kik, again, for, for taking the time. Uh, it was awesome chatting with you. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, thank you very much.